Well, today's topic, uh, the novel approaches to exercise, not just because um, novelty is needed to drive innovation to move us forward, but also because over the past year, I'm sure all of us have had to adapt our research programs and our clinical programs with COVID. So this afternoon, uh, we'll hear a little bit about innovation just to keep us moving forward and challenging ourselves to provide something different for the patients. And also um, in terms of things we can provide for the patient remotely to help meet that challenge that the pandemic has brought us. Um, and then again, just the constant need to integrate um, and understand how this, uh, what patient preferences um, and perspectives are and see that through that lens as well. So without further ado, I am going to introduce our first speaker, who I can see has joined us, Dr. Charlene Greenwood. Um, and I'm sure we all know Charlene's name, but I'm going to uh, introduce her. So she is a consultant physiotherapist at King's College Hospital. She's an honorary senior clinical lecturer at King's College, London, and an IHR postdoctoral research fellow. She co-chairs the UK Kidney Research Consortium Exercise and Lifestyle Clinical Study Group, co-chairs the Kidney Quality Improvement Partnership, and is president of the British Renal Society. Charlene is also an advanced clinical practitioner with 15 years of experience as a specialist renal physiotherapist. She leads a clinical research team of 15 therapists and leads on various research and clinical innovation projects in renal, cardiac, and physical activity. She leads one of the only commissioned renal exercise services in the UK, which includes renal rehabilitation, weight management, and specialist kidney transplant exercise clinics. So without further ado, we'll do a virtual clap for Dr. Greenwood. Thank you. I'm gonna try and just share my screen. Is that okay? Can everybody see that? Yep. Is that okay? Yeah, great. Okay, so first of all, good evening, everybody. And thank you so much for inviting me to come and talk to you all tonight. It's my tonight, it's some people's today, um, about Kidney Beam, which is a physical and emotional well-being platform. So why did we decide to do Kidney Beam? So as the COVID pandemic hit the UK, Hospitals closed down their non-emergency activity to allow a maximal frontline response. As a physiotherapist, I joined my colleagues on the front line to work on the renal COVID wards. And this meant we had to close down our face-to-face -face renal rehabilitation class that we run at our hospital. During that time, I became acutely aware that our patients at King's College Hospital, but also around the UK, were shielding at home and were feeling isolated and were reporting a deterioration in both physical and mental health. I realized at that time that there was a real need to find a way to reach these people at a time of crisis. So what did we do? Um, well, I got in contact with an old friend and colleague, Pamela Scarborough, who together with her friend, Katie Bell, who's a technical wizard, had created Beam for Cystic Fibrosis. With a desire to create something to connect with kidney patients as quickly as possible, we were able to collaborate with Pam and Katie to adapt the platform for Kidney Beam. Recognizing the funding need, I spoke with Sandra Curry, who is the Chief Executive for Kidney Research UK, and I told her all about our plan. Having worked together with Sandra to produce the recent statement around physical and mental health, which was co-produced by Kidney Research UK and also the Centre for Mental Health in the UK, Sandra understood the very real need to get something out there as rapidly as possible to support patients at a time when it was most required. This led to a rapid funding agreement, which only took 48 hours to secure. Our team at King's College Hospital helped us to gain approval to run a UK-wide pilot program, and we were therefore able to go from idea to funding to launch in a record time of only six weeks. Members of our UK Kidney Research Consortium Exercise and Lifestyle Clinical Study Group, as well as patient partners, all pulled together to work to create um, our kidney disease-specific physical and emotional wellbeing platform. 
The Kidney Bean platform combines on-demand exercise and educational sessions, as well as a variety of live classes with inbuilt behavior change techniques, such as scheduling and email reminders. All the classes on Kidney Beam are delivered by experts who are either living with or working with the kidney disease condition. So we uh, ran a pilot project. Um, the pilot started in June this year when we were right in the midst of the COVID pandemic. And within a month of getting all of the classes ready and all of the instructors trained, we launched and then we ran this pilot project between July up until the end of November. And during that time, we collected some information, so from patients who very kindly offered to, to do a survey with us. So during the pilot, we had 959 people sign up to use the platform. And this was mostly in the UK, but it was from other countries because we did put it out as a global opportunity. Of that, 736 people were living with a kidney condition, 127 were medical or exercise professionals, and there were 34 uh, people who were a caregiver to someone with a kidney health condition. So looking at the age groups, we had a good spread of ages, um, but only a, a small amount of people under the age of 25, so between 18 and 25, and also uh, above the age of 75. And that may be to do with um, some of the technological difficulties um, that we experience with getting people onto the platform and is something that we are now working really hard to help handhold people on the platform. Okay, when looking at the um, kidney clinic that patients are attending, you can see that in the blue we've got GP and uh, the GenNeth clinic in the yellow and in the sort of peachy color we've got our kidney transplant clinic and you can see that's where the majority of patients came from with a smaller amount of patients who were hemodialysis and peritoneal dialysis patients. Sorry, my, oh, there we go. Sorry, got stuck there for a second. Um, when looking at comorbidities that patients reported on sign up, uh, you can see that the top three um, conditions that were reported were high blood pressure, conditions which involve joints or muscles, and also depression. Just looking at the UK sign ups, um, the patients who did report where they had. Um, where they were located within the UK, you can see that there were a large number that came in from London, uh, but there was a spread around the rest of the UK. So during that pilot time um, that the pilot project was running, we saw 1,105 on-demand classes that were completed, 829 live classes completed, and a total amount of 60,455 movement minutes completed in that time. We did do a patient survey. Um, this was a survey monkey and it was voluntary. Um, we had 240 patients who completed it at sign up. And at the end of the pilot, um, we had a further 75 people who uh, kindly completed and allowed us to then use some of their information to show you how it went. Okay. So this is just looking at um, general health and emotional health. And you can see that the indication is that people experienced a better general health and emotional health. In terms of energy levels and overall mood, you can see improvements. Uh, sleep didn't appear to be improved. It wasn't a, a program which was particularly aimed at sleep, although sleep is a very well recognized problem and something that we would like to look at in the future. When looking at, I think Nancy was talking about this, looking at what's really important to patients. And one of the questions that we asked is, um, about whether patients enjoy exercise, whether they feel motivated to exercise and whether they feel confident to exercise. And you can see that more people were reporting um, that they were enjoying exercise, being motivated and being more confident to exercise at the end of the pilot. 
This was really important to us to ask patients whether they were meeting what are the adult physical activity guidelines. So we asked people whether they were doing two days a week of strength training, 150 minutes of moderate activity per week, or 75 minutes of vigorous intensity activity. And you can see that a higher percentage of patients were completing or meeting those uh, physical activity guidelines at the end of the pilot. So really importantly, we wanted to ask patients what they liked most about kidney beam. So we did some free text answers for this and we ranked these according to the most, um, most frequently appearing answers. So the first, uh, the top one was that the program is run by professionals who understand the kidney specific health condition. So you can see here, this is a patient quote, which says the classes were really good. They helped me to work at my own pace and never pushed me further than I felt able to go. The teachers were informative and understanding of being a kidney patient. I didn't feel that my weight was an issue and gained confidence in doing a live class. I liked that if I missed a live class, I could do on-demand classes in my own time. It's a fantastic scheme. Also the ability to exercise in your own home. Um, so you can see a quote there, being convenient to use at home and access beam at any time. Also the variety of classes. So this patient reports that she really liked the variety of classes on offer. At, uh, she took part in live yoga classes as well as the on-demand HIIT classes, both at different ends of the spectrum, but both so beneficial to overall physical and mental health and found that the information videos were also really interesting. A big one which came up with people was the ability to connect with other people. And uh, I think this was especially pertinent at a time when people were feeling isolated and were shielding. So this patient reported feeling part of a group or a community. We also asked people what they liked least about kidney beam. And the top one was nothing, which was great to hear. Um, and this patient said they uh, were hoping that it would remain a constant in their life. But the thing which did come up um, second most was the technological issues. Uh, so this patient reported having difficulty connecting with the program. Uh, it may have been down to their own technology, but we did have problems with people being able to access Zoom, learning how to access the program, and just people who hadn't used technology prior to COVID on a very steep learning curve with that. Also the time of the live classes. So because we uh, put this out really quickly, we were using um, people's time, mostly at King's, but also a lot, a lot of people that were um, helped us out from Leicester as well. And we had to stick to what was people's working hours. So we did a lot of daytime classes. And um, so the lack of evening slots and also weekend slots was something that came up and something that we can now address. This was a good one. So getting into different positions. Um, so this patient reports hating to crawl around on the floor while trying to see the screen. So that's a difficulty and, um, and has also led us to include more classes which are in seating and standing, um, seated and standing for the patients who find it difficult to get down onto the floor. So we asked what improvements patients would like to see. So as I mentioned, evening and weekend classes, and also for recording all the classes for people to catch up at a time when it's convenient for them. Help with technology. This is something that we've already started doing. So this is talking, uh, this patient has said uh, to talk people through how to connect to the platform so that it allows them good access to the site. Um, and she says that having to use the mobile really restricted her motivation to join in. And this one as well, really important. So the first part of doing this um, pilot uh, program, we just put this out there really quickly. And the, the most of the people that we connected with, we connected with via social media. And so we weren't handholding people onto the platform. We weren't approaching them via clinics. Um, and what this, this patient is saying is that having a chat with an instructor each month to talk about motivation and set goals would be really important and um, we are looking at that now. More variety of classes, so we love this idea, so some more taster classes of other types of exercise so that um, we can gauge the level of interest and add those classes to the timetable. 
and as I mentioned already, doing more standing or seated classes for patients. So we've had a big social presence. Um, those of you who have seen us on Twitter, we're also on Instagram and on Facebook, and um, it's been brilliant. We've been able to connect with lots of patients who um, have been using the platform. And um, these are just some of the quotes from people who have said how much they've enjoyed being able to use the platform. So we asked um, whether people would recommend Kidney Bean to a friend and um, we had an overwhelming response saying that people would recommend Kidney Bean. So where are we going next with Kidney Bean? So we, during the pilot program, we were already looking at funding uh, for the following year and um, we were successful in securing that. So Kidney Bean remains uh, free at the point of access for people within the UK. We are looking at introducing more emotional well-being. We've just started um, including some art therapy. Uh, we've got some print classes and drawing, and um, I think we're just about to include a guitar lessons uh, course as well. Mindfulness and also uh, friendship groups. Standing and seated classes for, um, especially for patients who are on hemodialysis, we've been asked and we've just put out some seated classes for those people. We've had lots of requests for uh, kidney bean for kids, and um, this is something that we'd really like to pursue. We're also in the process of looking at kidney transplant prehab and post rehab programs that can be delivered through the platform. And then also bringing our weight management um, onto the kidney bean platform as well. From a research perspective, um, we are, we've uh, secured funding to do a research project which will take place over tw the next 12 months. It's going to be a multi-center weightless randomized controlled trial and it will examine the clinical value and cost effectiveness of the online physical and emotional well-being resource uh, which is kidney bean for the improvement of health related quality of life in people with chronic kidney disease. And we'll also look at the patient experience, so having a nested qualitative study in there. The ultimate goal of this program is to, is get, this, to get this commissioned um, for the NHS. So part of um, designing our research study was to connect with our clinical reference group and our renal transformation plan in the UK uh, to align our research project uh, and our outcomes uh, to support the commissioning of the program after the 12 months. So I have to acknowledge a lot of people. I'm here talking about this today, but there is a huge team that have been behind this and have all put in so much time and effort. I'd really like to uh, thank our patient partners, uh, the team at King's, I uh, have to especially mention Juliet Mays. You'll have seen her on the platform if you've been on there and she's been helping me lead this up. Um, the Bean team, so Pam and Katie and the rest of the marketing and all the other things that they do, Kidney Research UK team, and also our UK KRC exercise and lifestyle team. So all of these people have put their time and effort into producing educational videos, teaching on the platform, and also contributing to the research design. So thank you to everybody. That's our, um, our website address, and that's where you can go in and find out a little bit more about the platform. So thank you very much for um, inviting me on to talk about Kidney Bean. Any questions? Sorry, I'm gonna have trouble unmuting myself. Thank you, uh, Dr. Greenwood. I've actually used your kidney beam. So I think it's a wonderful tool. And from what I've heard, and some of us have heard from patients is they really want something that's dedicated to people with CKD. And so that really fill, fills that need. Um, I'll say we have five minutes for questions and we can enter them in chat or ask Dr. Greenwood uh, directly. I will recommend that you mute your mic though, if you're not speaking. Um, since I'm already hogging the mic, I'm going to ask a question about, because you did touch on this, um, Charlene, about digital uh, literacy. Mm. And I was, yeah, and, and 
as we're aware, this is a bit of a barrier in this population. So I was just wondering if you had tr any plans for a digital engagement strategy or how you saw that unfolding. Yeah, so we recognize that that's probably our biggest barrier. And um, we've been really fortunate that part of our research project over the next year, we've secured um, some time from a, uh, a digital fellow who is going to look specifically at this area. We've already seen anecdotally that if we spend time with patients, showing them exactly how to go onto the platform, helping them to um, sign up with Zoom, some patients haven't even been on Zoom before, um, that we can make that connection and make that journey much easier. Um, so it's really just about us working out what type of toolkit we need to help which you know, different patients to engage. The other thing is also language um, and also subtitles. And uh, we do hope further down the road to be able to develop both of those as well. Wonderful. Peter is asking um, what the response rate to your survey was. So, um, like I said, we had 240 people who, um, who um, did the, the survey right at the beginning on, on boarding. And then we had 75 people that completed it at the end. So, obviously, we recognize a lot of bias uh, within that. Um, but it was a voluntary thing, which was done via an email invite. Wonderful. So it wasn't to do research. Good. Nancy, you're asking, uh, you're asking about how they will do the qualitative aspect. Did you want to ask any more about that? She may have. Hi, yeah, I'm on. Um, I was, I'm curious because I come from a patient and community engagement research background. And I find qualitative research really enhances our quali quantitative work that we're doing. So I'm interested to know, uh, you did mention, mention patient experience. So can you tell me more about that and how you see that unfolding for your next research project? Yes, absolutely. So I am not going to claim to be an expert in qualitative research, but we've got, in fact, I know that Hannah is on, um, Hannah Young is on, on the, the symposium. And Hannah's going to be leading this up along with Jules and Ellen Castle, who's also on. Um, but the intention with it will be speaking with patients uh, or people um, at the end of um, a small pilot that we're going to do as a run in uh, to get some experience and then to uh, connect with patients when they finish doing intervention uh, with us um, in the program. And um, it'll be a mixture of semi-structured interviews and and um, yeah, it, it's uh, it, it's really really important. All of our research now includes the qualitative uh, component, like you say, to to really um, help evolve what it is that the quantitative data is showing. So I'm not sure if, if um, Hannah wants to add anything. If you're there, Hannah. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. <laughs> Nothing to add, really. I think Charlene's articulated it really well. I guess at the end, we'll probably be asking people about sort of how they maintain what they've achieved um, during the program as well. But yeah, we're just doing um, initial experiences with interviews and then some follow up work afterwards, asking them about how they found the platform um, and what we can build upon really to help them maintain. Had you thought about talking to people that might drop off of the platform to see what's happening with them and why they might not want to continue? Yeah, I think if we can get, if we can um, sort of engage with those people, we will try and get that because that is really important to understand why it is. And maybe people as well who signed up to take part, um, but perhaps didn't end up engaging in any of the exercise classes because that will be important to understand as well, definitely. Awesome. Okay. okay, thank you. I think the other thing, the digital um, fellow is going to be doing a lot of work around people that haven't signed up and what the technological difficulties are with that. So hopefully that will enrich the data as well. Thank you. Uh, Ken is asking, uh, saying, great job. You clearly have attracted CKB patients that are motivated. Do you have any plans to reach patients who are not as inherently motivated to sign up? Absolutely. So I think 
what we clearly have shown here is it's just been put out there and it has attracted uh, people who um, have wanted to come on and give it a go. Um, the next step and certainly what the research project will, will be looking at is having a kidney bean champion in, re in renal units who are able to connect with patients and I think one of the most important things I know this from working in clinic that patients want to know is that it's safe and that when you when they look at your specific condition is that okay and is that okay now so it's really about um doing that reducing the fear of of doing activity and being able to check in with patients uh, so I think those kidney bean champions will, will be able to help with that. Um, so yeah, I, I, I look forward to responding back to, to how that goes. Wonderful. Thank you, Dr. Greenwood, again. That's all the time we have for questions. Um, and you may have some at the very end, uh, but I will hand it over to Joao. Thanks very much. Bye. Thank you again. Hello everyone, nice to see so many of you here. Thanks Steph and thanks Charlene for the presentation. It's now my turn to introduce our first trainee speaker, Dr. Nicola Lambretti, completed master degree in preventive and adaptive exercise science and his PhD in biomedical science and currently holds a fixed term research position at the University of Ferrara in Italy. His main research interest is in tailored exercise programs to counteract the conditioning in elderly patients with chronic diseases, particularly kidney, vascular, and neurological disorders. He will be presenting preliminary data from a non-randomized patient-centered pragmatic trial of a simple training program managed by an exercise facilitator for people on dialysis. So without further ado, I hand it over to Nicola Lambretti. Yes, uh, can you hear me? Many thanks for your presentation. Okay, great. I'll try to share my screen as well. Yes, please do. So you should be able to see my screen, is it right? Um, yes, all good. Okay, great. So good evening from uh, Italy, or have a nice day for the other hours. And uh, let's start from uh, this uh, something that we all know, we all know that uh, end stage kidney disease is associated with a sedentary behavior, increased mobility and mortality. And fortunately, we also know as well that the intervention counteracts these risks and improves health and quality of life. But on the other side, unfortunately, we also know that exercise programs are usually poorly attended due to several barriers to exercise. At the end of the EXCITE trial, we surveyed the people that completed the trial that were 81 patients uh, on dialysis, asking them a simple question. Do you believe that it's important for a dialysis patient to perform physical activity? And since 86% uh, of patients answered yes, we asked them three more questions, asking what of the following software they would like to have the presence uh, the, the, to do exercise into the dialysis center and three patients out of four answered yes. More surprisingly, nine out of 10 patients uh, would have appreciated the presence of an expert of an exercise into the dialysis center, whereas only 60% of patients answered that they would have liked to have free or discounted access to community-based facilities. Moreover, also in a relation to a recent email sent by Professor Bennett that asked for training centers uh, for the dialysis patient. This is our rehabilitation unit where we work uh, with Professor Manfredini every day. That is 50 meters from dialysis, but for this study, we used this, <laughs> uh, this corridor that is our dialysis center and just three pieces of equipment, elastic band, ankle weights, and a metron that can usually be stored in an end luggage. So starting from uh, these uh, opinions collected from the patients and from the evidences present in literature, we focused on several, several pivotal points from our trial. At first, the involvement of patients' association and stakeholders. Moreover, also the involvement of nephrology unit personnel without causing them an overload of work. The assessment of performance and preferences of the patients 
And upon uh, the verification of patient exercise capacity, the design of tailored training program. Obviously, the involvement asked by the patient of an exercise physiologist within the team, also keeping an eye on the cost and the burden for the national health system. So, all this feature led up to the setup of an exercise facilitator into the dialysis center. So, the study I'm going to present to you is a pragmatic non randomized feasibility trial that is currently enrolling patients with this inclusion criteria. You can find the protocol published and the report. And upon the um, verification of the eligibility, the collection of informed consent and the execution of the battery of the outcome measure, the patient may choose between three, train, three training options and one non-training option that I detail to you now. The first option is a supervised training to be performed under supervision of the exercise facilitator into the dialysis center immediately before or after the dialysis session, lasting for about 30 minutes, two or three times a week. And this program includes low intensity interval working and exercise for lower limb strength and flexibility. Otherwise, patient may choose for between a structure on based low intensity exercise based on the excite uh, study model that encompasses a uh, low intensity interval working for eight minutes per day to perform at home at a progressively increasing speed. Or patient may choose also between uh, unstructured physical activity that are simply the recommendation of the American College of Sport Medicine to do aerobic uh, amount of exercise or finally they may only opt for a three-month periodic assessment of exercise capacity without starting any program for now there are several outcome measures uh, in this trial and um, qualitative outcomes that uh, obviously will focus on the rate of patient that will choose each of the training options proposed upon the eligible patient and quantitative quantitative outcomes that will include obviously endurance as the primary outcome, but also a lower limb strength, uh, depression, quality of life, uh, and laboratory and long-term outcomes. The study started in uh, late spring and we, uh, there were 114 eligible patients, 50 adhered immediately to the program, whereas 65 at the moment did not. And in the pie chart that you are below, uh, you can see the reason reported by the patient for a non-participation, and we can see that uh, most of the patients said, I am not interested in making exercise. But focusing on the 50 participants, uh, we can see that the majority of them chose the supervised exercise into the dialysis center or the low intensity home based structure program. Notably, no differences were related to the choice of the patient, uh, nor to age or gender, and uh, also, the choice of the patient was totally independent from the distance uh, from their house to the dialysis center. Otherwise, uh, significant differences were noted for the baseline exercise capacity. When the less fit patients, that, uh, according to the 6 minute working distance measured at baseline, of chose the supervised low intensity program under the supervision of the exercise facilitator. Unfortunately, the COVID-19 pandemic also stopped uh, our trial. So at the moment, uh, when I send the abstract, uh, send the abstract, only 24 patients completed the three months uh, follow-up, uh, and 12 uh, belonged to the supervised group, and 12 to the home-based structured exercise low intensity group. At this line, uh, we confirm what we have seen before, so that the patient that chose the supervised option were significantly older had a higher comorbidity, seven versus five, the Charleston index, and as well as a significantly lower exercise capacity, 222 meter worked in the six minute test compared to 360 meter. As well, they have a lower, significantly lower quality of life as reported by several domains of, of the SF36 question. All patients completed the training program without any adverse event during the training session or related to them. Starting from the left of the slide, we can see the 
result obtained in the six minute walking distance that both groups significantly improve again without any between group differences. Similar results were observed for the lower limb strength as measured by the five times C2 stand test, where both groups significantly improved this parameter again without any between group differences. Also, the quality of life was significantly enhanced after the three-month program, especially for the physical functioning domain and the mental health domain, again, without any between group differences. The subsequent analysis of covariance that was necessary due to the baseline unbalance between the two groups confirmed the lack of between group difference for all outcomes analyzed for both groups. So, to summarize, upon uh, all the limitations that are mainly derived from the simple size, that are absolutely the results I have presented are absolutely preliminary, and side design for the lack of, randomizing, of randomization, just uh, to cite one of the limitations of the study design, we can conclude that uh, for the first time, at least to the best of my knowledge, in a clinical trial, the patient they can choose the exercise methods they prefer they would like the most. The exercise and the supervision of an exercise facilitator into the dialysis center is particularly appreciated by the more fragile patient. And in general, low and moderate intensity working sessions were saved, avoided the pre-participation screening and significantly improved the outcomes. Obviously, only the trial continuation will confirm if a low cost intervention that is potentially implementable in any dialysis unit worldwide can be affected at improving physical function in and stage kidney disease patients. Many thanks to you for your attention. Many thanks to our research group, Professor Fabian Ferdini, Dr. Giovanni Piva, that is currently working on this project. And if you have any question, I will be glad to answer. Many thanks. Thank you, Nicola. Uh, so we have time for some questions. So if you want to write them in the chat, and meanwhile, I'll ask one question. Um, is there any particular reason for not including the, the choice of intradialytic cycling as an option? Um, I mean, cycling or intradialytic exercise during dialysis. And another question is, uh, have you considered using um, the selection of more than one option? Because in this design, it seems that you can only choose one option. If you can just comment on those those points. Okay, thanks for uh, your question. Um, about the first one, yeah, we all we all know that uh, there there is a wide evidence uh, of the effectiveness of uh, intracycling uh, uh, cycling during during dialysis training, but uh, we choose uh, to not select this option because we wanted to um, just uh, make something that is uh, potentially implementable worldwide, also in the dialysis center that are countryside dialysis center that did not have any type of funds that maybe they cannot afford uh, cycling for dialysis. And focusing on the second question, yes, uh, we have uh, several patients that actually asked uh, to perform more than one program. So uh, in the first time we have just advised them to select one and to complete the three month program. Then if they want, they will choose another one and continue to perform exercise. Obviously, this when we will be analyzing the results will be uh, a critical a critical issue. But our statistician is, uh, is is quite confident about that, so I am confident too. Okay, thank you. I think we answered Ken's question because it's similar to mine. So we have a question here from Tom. Given that fitter, I think you can read it as well if you want. But given that fitter patients choose to be in control group rather than undergo supervised training. Do these patients need other types of support to be active? Uh, I am just uh, searching for the question. Eh? It's the... <laughs> <laughs> just a minute. <clears throat> yeah, if you want, I can read it out again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, I find, I find it. From Tom Wilkinson, yeah. Yes, uh, again, uh, I just uh, answered before. Uh, for example, we did not have uh, the, the cycling uh, in, in our center. So uh, it would be absolutely interesting to, to know how many patients would have been, would have chose the intra exercise. So we can ask them, absolutely we can ask them. Yeah, 
Okay, but the, the question I was mentioning was from Tom, so not, not Ken. Uh, so, uh, oh, sorry. <laughs> because you mentioned that the fitter patients choose to be in control group rather than uh, the supervised training. So do these patients need other type of support, do you think? What are your comments on that? Yeah, maybe, maybe Tom, Tom, Tom is right. And just to point out that only two patients at the moment chose the control group. So we don't know uh, if uh, they, yeah, they seem to be the fitter. Yes, of course. But at the moment, uh, it's just preliminary. So um, I just wait to have more patients that choose the control group and then we'll, we'll discuss about them. Okay. We are getting more questions in the chat, so feel free to answer them, uh, but now we have to move on. So thank you again for your nice presentation and I'll end thank you. over to Tom. Thank you, Nicola. Thanks, Joao. Thanks, Nicola, for the, um, the, the presentation. Um, so I'm going to introduce our next speaker who did email that they were running late, so I'm hoping that they are on the, uh, on the, the call. <laughs> um, so the next speaker is Maddie Warren. Um, so Maddie um, runs a consultancy specialising in patient involvement, engagement and advocacy, uh, working with clients in healthcare medical devices, um, as well as uh, occupying a range of voluntary roles um, in the UK Kidney Committee. Previously, she was Vice President in the Human Capital Management at Goldman Sachs. She studied at Cambridge University and the London School of Economics. And Maddie has been managing her own dialysis um, at home for 22 years since she was a teenager. Um, for those who know who Maddie is, she's a very passionate patient leader, advocate and peer supporter. Um, Maddie spends her time fitness training, horse riding and jumping and also with her formation skydiving team fireflies and she was the first woman on dialysis to run the london marathon completing it in 2018 to mark her 20-year dialysis anniversary and that leads her it quite nicely onto the title of her talk which is living with kidney disease a marathon not a sprint so maddie um if you're here um please feel free to start your uh, talk. I am here, thank you Tom. Okay, I'm, I'm, just going, I'm just going to share my screen. Give me one moment. So, can everybody see that? Brilliant, thank you. And thank you very much for that introduction. And it's been, it's great to um, be involved and hear the presentations as well. Um, as you might have noticed from my introduction, I'm very passionate about about exercise personally but also um, how important it is to um, all of us in the kidney community and um, it's been fantastic to be involved in the Grex Patient Council um, alongside Nancy and, and Kevin as well um, this past nearly a year um, so thank you for inviting me to speak and I guess um, what I want to talk about this evening I will explain a little bit about my background just because it's relevant to how I've ended up where I am and how exercise plays a part in that but also how that's actually happened in practice for me and how um, some of the interactions I've had with healthcare professionals and with other patients and um, sort of through my, my kidney experiences have led me to becoming so passionate and engaged in exercise because I would say it wasn't something that necessarily was there at the start and it's certainly been a combination of factors that I would really like to look at how we can encourage that to be replicated for all our patients but most importantly I would completely echo what Nancy said um, is that we've got to meet people where they are at and exercise and fitness looks very different for everybody and um, I definitely don't think that we're trying to encourage everyone on dialysis to run marathons far from it um, and actually that's really important and I do think it came up just today in, in conversation with some other patients is that we need to sort of understand what motivates individuals and what their goals are and what what feels like a success for them um, rather than aiming to do something that is so far out of reach that you pot potentially could set people up to fail so I know that the marathon story gets a lot of attention um, because it's quite unusual and I, I like to caveat with the fact that you know what the rest of the time I'm really not running marathons and it's nothing as extreme as that 
Um, but so as Tom mentioned, um, I run my own business as a patient engagement consultancy, which I set up a few years ago after a career in banking, because I found that I was doing all my work in banking and spending every spare moment and all my weekends and all my annual leave days getting involved in the kidney community. And I realized that's really where my passion lay. So I needed to move my career in that direction. And I feel very privileged to be able to um, embed my passion for kidney healthcare and my personal experiences into my work. Um, and then um, as Tom also mentioned, I have a lot of hobbies, most of which are quite dangerous and high risk. I won't comment on why that is, but um, I do enjoy jumping out of planes and riding horses and increasingly um, have become a bit of a fitness obsessive. Um, but I'm also hugely passionate about being involved across the kidney community in a range of areas, particularly focused on things like encouraging uh, dialysis choice, um, especially home dialysis options, um, and also working with our young adult kidney patient community in the UK and looking at things like quality improvement and um, service design in terms of broader kidney care. So that certainly keeps me busy professionally. Um, and then from a kidney point of view, um, I developed uh, FSGS, so uh, and a very aggressive form of FSGS and autoimmune condition when I was 13. It came very suddenly out of the blue. I'd never had any health problems before that. And um, it really wiped me out very quickly. So I went from being a normal, um, happy teenager at school, just doing my thing, to being basically in hospital all the time, having a lot of treatments, including steroids and chemotherapy, immunosuppressive medication. But my kidneys failed within about 18 months. And um, I went on to dialysis and I'll come back to a bit about that sort of transitional period in a moment um, and since then I had a failed transplant attempt from my dad in 2003 but sadly my FSGS recurred immediately and again very aggressively and didn't respond to any treatment and um, we made the decision that transplantation for me is too high risk and I wouldn't go for another transplant again unless there was significant advancement in the treatments uh, for FSGS so that's why I have now ended up on dialysis 22 years so far I've always dialysed at home. I did five years on PD and the remainder on um, home hemodialysis and I could not be more positive about my dialysis experiences. Um, I, have, I have had an amazing run of really positive, great quality dialysis and that has facilitated uh, many of the things that I've been able to do in my life. Um, and so it, for me, it's quite, um, I look back at some of these photos and I don't really recognize myself because I was so sick and going through such difficult sort of challenging times medically and it's actually quite nice to look back and think that you can hit rock you can hit rock bottom and be at the worst possible place medically and then come back from that um, and I only found a couple of these photos quite recently so that was when I'd just been um, had my kidneys removed in 1998 and the photo on the right I had been on dialysis probably a couple of weeks and had um, I had been carrying 15 liters or 15 kilograms of fluid around when I had my FSGS and then they took my kidneys out and dialyzed 15 litres of fluid off and underneath I looked a bit like a skeleton so um, I've kind of bounced back fortunately from that and then um, after my failed transplant which was in 2004 I switched over to hemo from PD and that was when I just learned to put my own needles in um, because I was training to go home on home hemodialysis and that really was I guess the start of a, a very positive um, chapter having had a great experience on PD I was quite unsure about home hemo and whether it would be as good but fortunately for me it really was um, and then as Tom mentioned um, I kind of somehow managed to run the London Marathon in 2018 and I don't know quite how I don't think I'll ever try and do that again I slightly feels a bit surreal that I even did that two years ago um, but I feel like I have come a very long way um, and I thought I'd talk a little bit about how that happened so I was not a particularly um, sporty person. I think I was at school, so I was doing all the normal fitness at school, but I definitely wasn't somebody who would make the first teams or be, you know, picked to compete in anything. I used to just do, you know, usual school fitness classes. And I was always into a lot of dance and gymnastics. Um, and I was a really passionate horse rider. So when I first went into hospital with FSGS and then went through kind of two or three years of being very, very unwell, I was desperate to get back on a horse. I could not there was nothing else that I wanted to do um, was get my life back on track so I could go horse riding. And that really was the entire goal. So when I started on PD, the first thing I asked was, when can I go back on a horse? Um, which was interesting because looking back, I think it was funny. I'd given myself something to aim for and it happened to be something that was semi-physically demanding, but it was something that I didn't really care what happened. I just wanted to reach this thing. And 
I think for all patients who have been through, especially early on in their diagnosis, if they're going through um, essentially the hell of being diagnosed with kidney disease and having to start dialysis and having your whole world turned upside down, if we're even going to start thinking about how to encourage and support fitness and exercise and actually more importantly mental well-being we have to help those people identify a goal that they are working towards because it's very difficult sometimes to find the thing that you're hanging on to um, that gets you keeps you motivated and keeps you going and for me that happened to be riding a horse and i gave myself that goal i don't really remember anybody i had fabulous care in pediatrics at the time but i don't really remember us discussing any of the physical aspects of, of getting back and fit. It was more about getting my dialysis treatment right and of course getting back to school. Um, but the horse is what I pinned my hopes on. So within about four or five weeks of having my PD tube put in, I decided I would go horse riding. Um, and I don't necessarily think that was particularly recommended at the time. But one thing I would reflect on, and I've reflected on this since as well, is that when you go into kidney failure and you start dialysis, whether that's PD or hemodialysis, you get told a whole load of things that you can't do anymore. And I think we, that's really powerful because you kind of find that, that your life closes in a little bit on you and you get told it might be that the fluid you can't drink, the dietary, the, the foods that you can't eat. It might be that the limiting schedule of your dialysis schedule going back and forth to hospital. It might be that you have a fistula and you get told don't lift or carry, don't use that arm don't weight train, don't wear anything around it, don't get your arm cold. It might be, um, you know, you, because of the side effects of medication, there are certain things you're told you shouldn't do. There's a lot of, with PD, you know, don't, don't get your tube infected. Um, be careful when you've got a belly full of fluid. All these things is like, don't do this and you can't do that. And I, and I think that on top of the devastation of losing your kidney function and starting dialysis is a real double whammy. Um, and I found out quite early on because I went and got on a horse and it was fine that actually sometimes the things I was told that I couldn't do, I could be a little bit flexible in my own mind about whether I really did that or not. And um, that set the tone for me right early on of starting uh, on dialysis that actually I needed to push the boundaries a little bit for myself and find out you know, what worked for me. And, and I was fortunate that the paediatric team, they didn't st start telling me not to do it. They kind of said, well, okay, if it's working for you, you should keep doing it. Um, so I was supported by my healthcare professionals right from the very start to try and rebuild my life in the way that I wanted to live it, despite the fact that I was now obviously reliant on dialysis. So I suppose rebuilding my fitness at that stage was much more organic. I was a teenager, I was at school, I was kind of running around quite a lot anyway. I went back to doing my PE classes at school um, and my, my fitness kind of just came back and PD obviously worked very well for me and I was doing my dialysis overnight, um, which meant it freed me up to have time to go to school and to, to pursue my hobbies and get back to doing things like dance and and uh, and doing a little bit of gymnastics and things like that so the first time i had to really address this it wasn't too difficult um and but but nonetheless i think i, I won't underplay the fact that dialysis is incredibly challenging and um what i always say to people is home dialysis and particularly the way i now i do dialysis so after i transitioned from pd to hemo is i do nocturnal home hemodialysis so i am dialyzing six or seven hours at least five nights a week. So I'm getting around 35 hours of great quality gentle dialysis all through the week compared to the 12 hours of in-center dialysis that most patients have. And I do think that's really important to bear in mind. And um, that's, that's not the focus of this talk. I could give a whole other talk about why I think we really need to build um, access to and help more patients be supported onto home dialysis because if you can't be doing more hours of dialysis a week and doing it more gently, you are always going to find it a lot harder to rebuild and, and to keep your physical fitness up, just because we know that, that three times a week really um, is quite debilitating. The fluid restrictions are very challenging, especially if you're trying to exercise and you have far more challenges with things like blood pressure that's fluctuating, feeling fatigued, having that post dialysis hangover that makes you feel very kind of um, lethargic and lots of things really get in the way of doing decent exercise. So. I would caveat this whole talk with the fact that if I was still doing three times a week dialysis, I don't know how fit or well I would be. So home dialysis plays a huge part in this. Um, and as we know, the dietary restrictions as well, um, you know, food and drink are an important part of 
of exercise and fitness if you can't get the nutrition right it is harder to really achieve a good level of fitness um and so it's much better for me now that i can eat and drink freely i can eat as much fruit and veg as i want i can drink as much water as i want because i'm doing so much dialysis um so that's just a i guess a side note uh, which i think it's important to, to bear in mind um so i mentioned my transplant which sadly was a complete disaster my dad was my donor um, and he donated his kidney, it was, that was in 2003, and, and we were very aware that there was a very high risk of my FSGS recurring, and sadly it did. Um, I obviously had a lot of nervousness about even an, a, accepting a kidney from my dad when I knew that the odds were that high, but uh, he's my dad, he insisted. I don't think anyone could have told him not to donate. Um, so it was obviously a very, that was obviously a very challenging time, but um, my dad, since then, uh, he has only got one kidney left. And um, as you can see here, he, he ran a marathon. I mean, he ran the marathon in 2017. And um, he's not a runner. He'd never ran anything before. He's in his 70s. So I was pretty impressed and amazed by that and um, thought, well, if he can do that, then why can't I? Which is the worst reason ever to sign up for a marathon. I'm not a runner either. Um, but I was just being ultra competitive. And I think also seeing him run the marathon and having gone through the transplant failure um quite a long time before that and knowing that after the transplant failed i basically spent a year having to rebuild everything again from scratch i couldn't even walk up the stairs um i i had a couple of near death experiences after my transplant due to complications and I'd, i had been so desperately unwell and it was tied up with a whole lot of guilt about you know not the kidney not working even though obviously it wasn't my fault and that it was very tied up in my dad's health as well because obviously he'd gone through major surgery to try and help me and then that hadn't worked out so um i found when he did the marathon actually because of all that history it was quite emotional and um i saw sort of, you know it was almost in honor of him that i thought oh, i'm going to try and do this too and he raised money for uh, the kidney patients association at our hospital and i raised money for the kidney charity so that was quite a pivotal moment I guess. Um, and I didn't have a clue what I was doing. So I would say, uh, you know, before I started marathon training, I was not really regularly going to the gym. I was kind of just sort of day to day fit, but nothing special. Um, and I rapidly realized that marathons are a really long way. And um, that I think <laughs> the first time I ran a mile and in under 10 minutes, which I think is what that shows there, I was, um, I was literally like, this is going to take a really, really long time to run 26 of these. And then I ended up having to train in the worst weather in the UK that we had ever seen. We called it the beast from the east because it was so cold. Um, and I was training in minus temperatures and snow and ice the entire time, um, which, you know, doing that and doing my dialysis and doing full time work, it was a real juggling act. But again, if you can do home dialysis, you can fit your fitness in when you want to, because the dialysis is completely in your control. Um, so I guess um, when training for the marathon, nobody really knew what a dialysis patient needed to think about for a marathon because not many people have done it. Um, I knew of about two or three people in the world um, who have done marathons before on dialysis. There's a, there's a guy called Shad Ireland who probably people know of who's done a triathlon. He's done an Ironman triathlon on dialysis. So obviously I knew it was possible, but there was very little information about how to handle the training, how to think about um, the sort of fluid management, um, electrolyte management, nutrition. So my doctor was initially just thought I was probably insane. And the next thing was he said, well, we'll have to work this out ourselves because there isn't really a protocol to follow to, um, to support your training. Um, and with that incredible open-mindedness from the team at the renal unit who just said, let's work this out together, instead of saying, we don't think this is a good idea, which I'm sure they could have said, they basically empowered me to think, actually, this is something that I can do. And um, it is something that I should try and do because it's always good, like I said, to have a goal and to have something that motivates you with fitness training. Um, and so I did achieve the London Marathon. I probably was the slowest person ever to do it. Um, but one of the things that was really a big part of my training actually wasn't the running. It was strength training and getting into the gym. Um, I'd always been a big fan of doing Pilates. I used Pilates very intensively to rebuild my core strength after PD and after all the surgery that I've had and that's always been very effective but I'd never really done strength training before and um, I started working with a personal trainer because I was told if you get your strength training right alongside your running training you will 
be, be you'll be far stronger you'll be less likely to get injured and you will be much fitter and that was probably the best advice that I was given um the marathon itself I did it very slowly it was 25 degrees on the day which was about it was about 25 degrees hotter than all the time that I'd been training so that was a bit of a shock to the system in terms of running in heat um but interestingly I I was very careful with what I was drinking in particular um and I didn't kind of go for any gels or anything that might be high in potassium I just drank water and a little bit of leucozade and I ate a small amount of kind of um, cereal bars and things like that the way around and the next day when I did my blood test before doing dialysis my bloods were perfect so it, there was no effect on my body whatsoever from running the marathon the day previously and I found that really interesting because um, there was a big expectation that my blood results could be all over the place and it potentially could have been quite dangerous for me to do it especially with things like potassium and sodium um, so that was quite heartening to find out that actually it didn't have any bad effects on my system um, but actually what stuck with me after the marathon I haven't run anything much since and I don't intend to I'm definitely not a runner but the strength training um, and the regular working out in the gym um, both kind of weight training and body resistance training alongside Pilates continually has had a huge effect on just my overall health and I mean the points that I've listed here these are all um, outcomes that I've noticed in the last two years from doing strength training two or three times a week um, I do still work with a PT, but I also do my own work in the gym um, and particularly things for me like um, I, I do kind of my, my only real side effect of being on dialysis is, is anemia, which does go up and down. And I'm actually quite anemic at the moment and my anemia is quite bad, but my symptoms are nowhere near as bad as they should be because I think my body is overall much fitter, my heart is stronger, and I, I've, I can tolerate the lower oxygen carrying capacity much better because I'm much fitter now. Um, I've noticed that my bone density scans, my bone density has improved dramatically in the past five or six years. Um, I was very much borderline kind of uh, osteoporosis, renal bone disease. I had high parathyroid. I've had my parathyroid removed. My bone density is now back to kind of normal levels for somebody of my age. Um, my pulse rate is much slower. I'm really physically strong. Um, you know, I, I haven't had any neg negative effects on my fistula. So one of the things we're always told is don't lift weights and don't do anything with your fistula arm. I've had the same fistula for 16 years now. I've been using it continually. Um, I've had a few kind of procedures done on it, but I am convinced that the reason my fistula is so good and so strong is because I use the muscles in my arm really regularly. Um, and finally, and probably most importantly, the mental health um, mental resilience side of living with dialysis and coping with everything is that the exercise plays a huge part in um, helping me manage my mental health feeling in control and feeling like I have really um, got as much control back over my body as is possible considering my body has given me some pretty scary moments over time and, and frankly I rely on a machine to stay alive and that's a fact I can't escape from um, but being able to do exercise and prove to myself how much stronger and um, um, how much I can achieve is a really powerful boost to my mental health and I, I really love to see the fact through BEAM and I, I have had some involvement with Charlene and working on BEAM over the last few months is that BEAM are considering not just the exercise components but also the well-being mental health aspects of what we need because frankly for kidney patients if we can't help people find a positive area with their mental health where and their, their kind of resilience to cope it's very difficult to try and set people on some kind of exercise program because we have to get mental health right first and the two go hand in hand and I, I think that's really important to remember um, I'm conscious of time so just very briefly obviously this year became very difficult to go to the gym and continue with a normal exercise regime um, and that's again why I think you know the work that, that Charlene and the team have done with BEAM is phenomenal these lambs have got nothing to do with exercise but um, when we all got locked down um, earlier this year um, and obviously had to stay at home I was lucky enough to um, be given four orphan lambs that needed to be brought up and bottle fed and looked after through kind of April, May, June this year. Um, and so since I have no pictures of me doing exercise at home in that period, I thought you might like to see lamb pictures instead. And that is a lamb in a dialysis box. And that is also a lamb sitting on my sofa watching TV with me. Um, but frankly, because I was already on an, a really positive exercise regime before the lockdown started, it was much easier for me to then take advantage of online um, classes and to kind of link up with doing things virtually um, which I think is, is, a, is an important point to note with things like Beam because Beam is now a phenomenal resource and I'm, I'm really hopeful to see 
where that goes and, and especially that we can prove the effectiveness but I do think it needs to go hand in hand with the real support from the renal unit team as well I think that doctors and nurses caring for patients need to really support those patients and encourage them to take advantage of those sorts of resources online and tell them that it's safe tell them that it is a positive thing and um, encourage them so that that person then feels more comfortable logging on and trying their first virtual class. Um, so I think, you know, the BEAM team are doing great work and it, we need to see the same kind of positivity and encouragement uh, from the hospital care teams um, to maximise that people's ability to, to give it a go and not have that worry about is this safe um, and am I going to do myself any kind of harm by trying exercise. And then the last thing I want to end on is I suppose we talk a lot about things like frailty um, and we talk a lot about um, long term dialysis side effects and, and people's ability. And I always like to remind people that there are a lot of young people out there who are kidney patients as well. Um, we have a very active, engaged young adult community in the UK um, and our patient community is sort of the 18 to 30 year old age group. Um, and we support each other a lot. We have a huge peer support component in what we do. Um, the photo at the bottom here is from an annual residential weekend where we go away with lots of our young adult kidney community and we do things like kayaking and abseiling and arts and crafts and we have social kind of events and we support each other very um, positively. And we're really focused on we have to live the here and now we're not we're not necessarily looking ahead to the future too far because um we don't necessarily know what our future holds and we've got our heads around that and that's fine but the more we can do to maximize people's quality of life here and now as kidney patients um, the more we can make sure that every moment counts for them and i think that helping people reach the peak of their fitness and their mental well-being is a really really critical part of caring for kidney patients and that's it. Thank you very much. Thanks, Maddie. Um, I'm sure you can see the comments and see how everybody has found that very inspiring. So thank you very, very much. Um, we've got, we're almost like bang on time, which is really nice. Um, so we've got five minutes for questions. I'm trying to keep up with the chat very quickly. Um, so there was a question early on um, from Henrik. Um, Maddie, I'm sure you can see this yourself, but I'll read it out anyway. Yes. Um, it says, how do you think we can get from the first important normal education to the more goal fo focused? I think that today there is only focus on the blood work and not on how the patient feels and how they can live outside the clinic. Yes, I, I would say there's a huge element of um, people who look at the numbers on the page. So, you know, your potassium's good, your blood pressure's in control, here's your medication, this is your dialysis prescription. Um, that's it, off you go, you're sorted. And actually, one of the things we often say is you could have a perfect potassium and a perfect blood pressure, but your mental health could be rock bottom and you could find it too tiring to even walk to the shop and back. So what's the point of having a perfect potassium if you can't actually live any of your life? Um, I know that that's a problem and a challenge the world over. Um, I, I, don't, I just think we have to keep talking about this. And I, and I think patients actually have a real powerful voice in that respect because if patients start demanding the support and demanding the information and demanding to know from their clinicians and from the nurses that care for them you know what can i be doing to have a better quality of life and this isn't good enough i think that's partly where this has to come because patients we have to tell we have to tell the healthcare professionals when we don't feel things are right so there's i'm not saying this is all down to healthcare professionals we you know we have fabulous care and and people are very busy and there's a huge demand a lot of patients and not a lot of time and, and i know that you know we have to be realistic um but i think a combination of patients vocalizing what they want i think patients talking to other patients peer support so get your patients to, to meet each other having things like a peer support um program or buddies within a renal unit so that patients can go and see other people who maybe are doing this well and are ex more experienced whether that's on dialysis or with a transplant so they can actually share their personal stories and encourage their peers that's really critical um, the work of grex and all the research the more the more data we have to prove the benefits of exercise and the wider we can get that out there the better but also this it, it should be really simple I, I this is not complicated i feel like discussing kind of how are you feeling have you been just sort of physically this last three months, you know, in your clinic appointment, it should be a set of standard questions that you ask that patient every time, not just how's it been, you know, with your medication or your dialysis prescription, but actually, um, you know, have you been able to go out walking recently? And, you know, how far do you typically walk? And if you're struggling with your walking, let's talk about that and, you know, find some parameters that 
for each patient are meaningful and just ask them the questions and build it into routine discussions in clinic. Great. Um, I think the next question is from um, Naomi. She says, um, hi, Maddie, you are very inspiring. Um, amazing talk as well. Can I, can I please <laughs> ask what sort of exercises, strength you do in the gym or on your own? And if you have any have a favorite one and which one it is I was kind of thinking the very similar thing in terms of I mean you can answer that question firstly but um, it was really good to see before Charlene showing this the, the beam was able to increase obviously people doing activity but particularly the number of people um, doing strength training and, and that's obviously something that we're, we're really interested in Leicester I mean what do you think is how do we get people to do do that and I mean that maybe comes on to Naomi's question as well it's like what type of things can we get people to be doing um you know why do you do it I would say the first thing is we need to stop terrifying people when they get diagnosed especially around fistulas because everybody just gets told don't like almost don't move your arm with a fistula and and the minute you scare someone because that's a lifeline so of course I'm going to be very protective of my lifeline but the minute anyone says to you by the way your fistula is incredibly delicate don't even lift a bag of shopping and that is what certainly I was told and I think I don't know about different countries but the advice about fistulas seems to still be quite strict and I have spoken to surgeons more recently who say yes that advice is quite out of date and actually we need to be better at giving um, realistic advice rather than kind of closing people down so for years I thought strength training was just completely off the cards because I was told don't do it with my fistula so I think for a start it would be nice to update that messaging for patients and say, you know what, yes, you need to be careful. Don't try and deadlift 80 kilograms, but it's absolutely fine to do low rate, like low weight, high, high rep kind of work. And actually, instead of saying, don't do all these things, say, here's some good things you can try. So immediately removing the fear factor around strength training specifically. I think the second thing, and Beam probably does do this very well, is that um, even for people without a health condition, you know, going into a gym can be very daunting. Um, you go in there and you see all these people kind of pumping iron and, and doing what they're doing. And, uh, you know, going into that with someone who's never done it before, it, a lot of people won't do it. So things like having um, gym equipment attached to the renal unit or attached to the dialysis unit where you've got that friendly environment, there are people who can show you how to use the equipment, make it familiar, sort of remove that scariness. Um, so renal physiotherapist is brilliant for that kind of thing or occupational therapist um, and, and access to those kind of gym that that sort of gym equipment would be really helpful. Um, I found um, I was very lucky because I went and worked with a, a, a personal trainer. Now I know that for a lot of people that's not possible because of cost or access. Also, I spoke to many personal trainers who just said they wouldn't train me because they were too worried about my condition um, and and you know potentially doing me harm. And so I was lucky to find a personal trainer who actually said, oh yeah, okay, we'll just adapt and train around. And you know, now if I'm anemic, he knows I'm anemic the minute I walk in the gym and he's like, right, we're taking it gently today because he's learned about me. So any partnerships that we can build with, with um, uh, PTs and professionals around the world to say, you know what, we'll educate you about kidney disease. And in return, you know, we, we can encourage all our patients to come and train with you and those sort of, you know, engaging fitness professionals to help deliver bespoke training that is safe and, and good for dialysis patients over and above things like virtual stuff like BEAM. Um, and, and you know whether there's ever any funding like social prescribing for example that could support that so people aren't having to necessarily pay for it um, I think that would be very powerful um, because once I started working with a trainer the strength exercises I just went from being really worried about them or being scared uh, just to loving it um, and I think yeah, but the question from Naomi around my favorite exercises I actually still am a massive fan of anything that's body resistance so rather than using any weights it, a lot of Pilates based stuff I think Pilates was really got me over the line from being very very unfit to actually getting back on that sort of I'm back in control um journey and so anything which is body resistance core strength um that you can do at home you don't need any equipment so it's it's cheap as well um is really a good place to start amazing thank you in the interest of time um mm -hmm. We'll, we'll move on, but um, I'm sure you can see there's lots of lovely comments and there's a couple of questions in there as well. Um, I know you're quite active on Twitter, so anybody who does have any questions, I'm sure you'd be happy to, to take them on Twitter. Obviously, feel free to reply in there as I well. I can reply to these as well. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the, the next um, 
the next um, speakers. Um, so we're going to hear next from um, Kevin Fowler and Nancy, and they're just going to provide um, a short commentary um, about living with kidney disease. So I know Kevin and Nancy are both on the call, um, so I'll hand it over to you both now. And thanks again, Maddie. Nancy, you want to go first? Well, I guess I could. Okay. Thanks, Kevin. Um, sure. So it's just me. I'm back again. Um, I'd like to actually really support a lot of what um, Maddie said. I've been in kidney failure for the last 22 years, almost 23. I was diagnosed at 12 with uh, proteinuria, but at that time, I'm so old, it was considered just weak kidneys. So there was actually no diagnosis and certainly no treatment or follow-up. Um, I was a crash start at 28, and the good news for me, and this is something that I would love to see happen with CKD, because of my passion for um, my sports, I'm not a great team player, but I did curl a lot, I skied, I, did, I was active even in walking to work and climbing stairs in my apartment, and that meant when even though I was a crash start and I was extremely anemic, I was actually still better fit than many people that are diagnosed with end-stage kidney disease. And to me, that brings to mind that the importance of making exercise a part of CKD, right from the very beginning, right from the early diagnosis, that we don't wait till they're almost on dialysis before we start talking about it. I'd also like to say, and this is, this is interesting, Maddie, because you raised some points about being on conventional dialysis and still being fit. What I learned, and I think this is important for all of us, is that when I was on conventional, I was still working. I did go to part-time because I didn't want to lose my recreation time. And so with that, I was still golfing after dialysis. I played at oboe in an adult band. I was skiing and still really active in the winter. I was still walking. And what I did when I brought this in, the people on my, um, my shift, many of them started to change their diet because they discovered that I had better runs on dialysis. And it wasn't that I was directly involved with them, but the role modeling that showed that I could still golf and ski and play oboe and be very involved in my life made a difference in a lot of their lives. And I think we need to take that to the dialysis unit, looking at wellness and recovery and fitness as a part of that and looking at other alternatives to the gym because indeed it's daunting, but that could be things like curling. I curled four days a week, and not only was it emotionally stimulating, and I know there's a few people out there that go, curling, what kind of sport is that? But let me tell you, 10 ends is hard work. And I loved it because I had the social connection, I had the sport connection, and I'm no athlete, trust me on this one, <laughs> but I loved it. And also the important aspect as well is that I actually worked part-time because I chose part-time so I could dialyze in the afternoon. But that brought me, I'm, an, I was, I'm a retired occupational therapist. That was the mental stimulation. That was the built-in, I shouldn't say built-in. Um, the people I worked with became part of my, my team and supporting me and taught me to include others in my health and recovery, which meant going in some days and saying, you know what, I'm really, really tired today. Could you please bring my patients in for me? And I did that. I remember doing that one morning. And when I went into my office, there was a cup of coffee sitting on my desk. I didn't even have to go and get my own coffee. But that was the kindness and support I got from staying at work and the people supporting me in my job. But it was two ways. By staying healthy, people really respected my activity level and my participation and my willingness to be vulnerable and say, I'm just having a really tough day and asking for what I needed. And I think that really takes us to that aspect of looking at what other ways can we be fit besides the gym. And my big excitement right now is a good friend of mine, I've actually been on a central line for years, came up with some ideas that got me back in the pool and swimming is one of my primary uh, fitness, my primary activities, which included synchronized swimming at one point and many years ago, competitive swimming. And so wearing lots of Tegaderm and a long sleeve swimsuit and I'm back in the water and I can tell you that I feel wonderful. Not only do I get to see her because I don't drive anymore, I get to see my, my swim partner three days a week, but I'm also feeling amazing. Like you said, the sense of, excuse me, the sense of accomplishment, the sense of well-being for the simple act of doing. 
and the joy of watching my progress and feeling so much better for it. So um, I have to thank Grex um, as a whole because I believe we're bringing wellness and recovery and thriving to life with dialysis because I too live on nocturnal. I'm, I am on nocturnal and I am at home and I've actually been home for 18 years and, and just loving it. It just keeps on getting better. So um, that's my brief story and I'm gonna pass that on to Kevin. Thanks, Nancy. And uh, also thanks to uh, what Maddie said. Maddie, I'm going to echo some of your points. Um, I was diagnosed 19 years ago with uh, polycystic kidney disease. And so I would just want to point out that my nephrologist was a key person influenced my decision about exercise because he got me to think about the long-term cardiovascular risk. And uh, I think that's a really rare role that nephrologists can do a better job of is uh, educating people on the benefits of exercise. And then, um, so I exercise pretty much well up until the transplant. And then after the transplant, where really exercise became critical is the uh, uh, medications, one of the medications I take has a lot of neurotoxicity. And uh, when I went to my transplant team, I was kind of dismissed. And uh, I actually had really uh, deep uh, depression due to a number of different events. My kids were four and six at that point. So when I got back into the exercise, I just saw how that you know uh, mitigated the side effects and um, just felt better, frankly. And so I probably exercise as much, and I'll, on my exercise, I'm pretty boring. I've been doing the elliptical. So Maddie has shamed me, and I, I, I hear this with my daughter all the time, so I'll make sure I take the message back. But I, I will say one thing I've been consistent is I do the elliptical, I probably do it every day. And I just feel the blood flow into my brain, and I feel better. And I think if, you know, for those of you that, I would encourage you to look at somebody's Facebook, communities of people that have had a transplant and look at all the suffering going on. And I think there's a lot of unnecessary suffering going on that could be corrected by routine exercise. And so I think like Manny said too, it's just, it's one thing I could control. I feel better. Um, it keeps me healthy and it's discipline, right? I think that's the thing too, is that you have discipline when you have the bad days, it just keeps the discipline. And I think discipline is critical um, to the journey. Yeah. And, um, and I just think also the role of cognition too, that uh, I know um, uh, Mara has been working upon. I think there definitely is a role. I think we'll see what the evidence says, but I think definitely exercise does help. And so I think that my message is, is that I think for people living with a kidney transplant in the United States, they are not being given the optimal opportunity to live a full life because many people are, are suffering and they're, they're suffering needlessly. And um, so my next path is going to resistance training, which I said I would do, I haven't done, in weight training. So Matt, Matt you shame me. So we'll be following um, up with you. Yeah, and I and I've uh, we have uh, I've had elliptical. It's uh, I've had it for about eleven years, but you know during the pandemic, I, every day, you know, I just I feel better. It's simple as that. So that's it for me. Thank you so much, Nancy, Maddie, and Kevin, for your inspiring uh, life and talks and comments. So let's keep going with our symposium. So I'm happy to introduce and to welcome um, Brad Burroughs, the next speaker, uh, as a trainee speaker. So Brad Burroughs is a PhD student at the University of Illinois at Urbana campaign, working under Dr. Ken Willen's supervision. His research efforts include investigating the effects of exercise and nutrition related to interventions and in health and quality of life of hemodialysis patients. He's also investigating how behavior change techniques can optimize the efficacy of these trials to improve patient report reported outcomes. So Brad is going to share with us his, his study entitled Fully Immersive Virtual Reality-Based Mindfulness Intervention in hemodialysis patients, a pilot study assessing safety and utility. So, Brett, all Great. yours, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Heyer. Um, can you guys see my screen? Yes. All right, great. Um, so I must have drew the short straw today, um, following up those great patient advocate stories. They're great, so thank you for those. Um, so today I'm gonna talk about um, a not an exercise uh, intervention, um, but hopefully this will be the groundwork for uh, future 
uh, exercise trials. Uh, so I'm going to be talking about a virtual, full immersive virtual reality based mindfulness mindfulness intervention that we did um, in hemodialysis patients um, where we assessed the um, safety and utility of the full immersive VR. Um, so some background. So VR has been used previously um, in hemodialysis patients. Um, however, they've used uh, more of non-immersive VR. So uh, kind of the downward right picture there using uh, Nintendo Wii. Um, so that's uh, where the, you know, your movements are depicted onto the screen versus full immersive VR, um, the top right picture where the headset covers your eyes and you're uh, kind of more fully immersed into a VR world. Um, and it seems much more realistic and lifelike. Uh, so to date, um, there's been no trial that has examined or explored the potential benefits of full immersive VR. Um, and then also you know, coupled with the fact that common um, hemodialysis symptoms um, are also associated with or similar to um, full immersive VR symptoms such as fatigue, nausea, uh, general malaise. So we, um, while we wanted to do a VR program, we wanted to first make sure that it was safe uh, for patients and it did not exacerbate these uh, common symptoms of hemodialysis. So we tested the uh, safety and accessibility utility of using a uh, fully immersive VR program um, while patients were on dialysis. So um, common inclusion and exclusion criteria here, the one thing to highlight is the history of epilepsy, seizure, or vertigo was excluded. Um, VR, full immersive VR can ex um, exacerbate these symptoms and just increase the risk of having an episode. So those um, individuals were excluded. Um, so our primary outcome was a um, what's called a simulator sickness questionnaire. Um, and what we did here was um, we had two exposures um, on consecutive treatment days. So on a Monday or a Wednesday or on a uh, Tuesday, Thursday. And immediately pre-exposure, um, we gave them this questionnaire to assess their level of symptoms. Um, and then following the um, exposure to the VR, um, the 20 minute VR session, we gave that to them immediately after to again assess their um, current symptom level. Um, we did that on both exposures and then um, post VR on both exposures, we also measured their level of presence or immersion of um, in their VR world. Um, so this basically just asked questions on, you know, how realistic the world was, um, how you could uh, move in the, in the VR world, um, questions like that. And then post-intervention, we also um, assessed the usability. So how patient-friendly was our VR program, um, as well as uh, participant feedback and clinical staff feedback to see if it was something that was, could be um, utilized safely and effectively in the clinics. So our virtual reality program, um, we called Joviality, um, we created, um, we used the Oculus Rift to immerse the participants. Um, and we used head movements for the participants to navigate through the uh, VR world. So they didn't use any handheld controllers at all. Um, we utilized head movements because we knew that majority of uh, hemodialysis patients with the fistula uh, hand movement is uh, limited. Uh, again, VR exposure occurred on two separate days, uh, but they were consecutive. And the um, immersion experience was about 20 to 25 minutes, depending upon how long they um, meditated for. Um, so the, the total mindfulness program was broken up in kind of two parts. Scene one, this top uh, picture here, where when they put the uh, VR goggles onto their head, uh, they were kind of immersed into this uh, you know, office-like setting with a fireplace and a television. And in the television um, was provided some didactic material on the benefits of mindfulness, how it can be used in everyday life. Um, and then in the second scene, in the bottom right-hand corner, um, with a tree there, it would, they were um, guided through a meditation um, exercises. Each scene was about 10 to 12 minutes in length. Um, so the results here, um, very common uh, baseline demographics, um, and we analyzed 20 participants in the study. Um, the results showed that um, one single um, mindfulness VR program lowered symptoms um, from pre to post VR exposure. So the simulator sickness questionnaire is broken up into these different um, uh, symptoms. And uh, like I said, pre, post VR um, exposure had a reduction in symptoms 
And then for day two, while the, the or for exposure to, while the symptoms were not a significant reduction, there was a notably reduced um, uh, pre-VR values in, in the symptoms. Um, so there may be some type of sustained effect from the VR mindfulness program that um, hopefully we'll test in future iterations. The Joviality program also um, we uh, found was patient friendly. Um, they had a total score of an 82 on the system usability scale out of 100. Um, so the um, most common thing was that they um, were able to navigate through the, the world. They figured, they thought that it was very realistic, um, that the um, head movements were not difficult. Um, the um, uh, navigating through the program was not difficult. Um, the IPQ score, the level of presence out of a seven, um, they were very high um, and consistent on both exposure one and exposure two, which was um, important. Um, the involvement um, and realistic uh, or experience realism was a little bit low compared to the other ones. That is probably because um, they did not interact very much with the world. Um, they did interact a little bit, but not to um, the level that um, you know, we possibly will in the future. Again, this was just a pilot study. Um, as far as the clinical staff feedback, it was all very positive. Um, the uh, clinical staff, we, we assessed eight clinical staff and they were the staff that were on the floor, the nurses and techs that we kind of dealt with um, throughout the intervention. Um, and then we interacted with. Um, so the, the staff didn't feel like we imposed on them at all um, or we impeded their abilities to um, treat the patients. And importantly, there were some times where the patients did need to have um, a, a nurse talk to them while they were on uh, exposed to the VR and they didn't have any trouble hearing them or communicating with them while they were um, exposed to the VR. Some qualitative feedback. Um, the most common kind of um, reason for liking the program was that it was relaxing and calming. 60% uh, found that it was relaxing and calming. Um, however, 40% um, thought that they needed to have more realistic graphics. So in the second scene with the tree, they were a little bit um, kind of abstract graphics and um, our population wanted more realistic graphics. Um, also importantly, they thought that they were able to um, escape the noise of the clinic um, and they enjoyed the, the program overall. Um, again, they were able to navigate the program with the head movements without any problems and um, they found that the program was beneficial um, for them. Um, some comments here that I thought, especially this first one, which was very um, telling about the program was an individual, she came in, she was having a bad day. Um, I remember she had, a, a, I believe she had a, a fight with her daughter, um, but she said she was feeling very upset and frustrated uh, today and didn't want to be bothered with the VR program. She just wanted to be left alone. Um, but after being a little cool horsed, uh, she did it and she you know, felt much more calmer and, and said that she was completely glad that she, she actually went through it. Um, and then another individual um, said that he immediately fell asleep um, during that tree meditation scene and that it was very relaxing. So some very positive reactions from the, the uh, participants. In conclusion, we uh, our 25-minute uh, fully immersive Joviality VR program was safe for the hemodialysis patients. Um, while during dialysis, we didn't have any adverse events. Um, and then it was also patient friendly as well. So the system, system usability scale was very high and um, we found that it was very user friendly. Um, and it didn't cause any disruptions in the clinic staff or the care of the patients. Um, so it may be a suitable alternative mode of intervention delivery. Um, however, the limitations were that there was no control group or day 100% that the VR mindfulness program was the reason for the reduction in the um, symptoms. And then also a very small sample size of only 20 participants. Um, future directions. So the uh, VR, full administrative of VR has potential to deliver interventions remotely or with little contacts. So this is important, obviously, right now with COVID. Um, and also has potential to deliver tailored interventions, which is important for not only exercise related interventions, but also for nutritional interventions and others. Um, and as um, we've heard from other speakers today, um, recruitment and retention rates is usually low with exercise or, or even nutritional interventions. 
and full immersive VR, being that it's a very new technology um, and kind of per pervasive technology, it may improve uh, recruitment and retention rates. Um, so some uh, future direction programs that we're kind of looking at is um, interdiotic cycling, um, nutritional education programs for like grocery shopping tours, um, educating the patient on um, kind of how to do grocery shopping for themselves versus going out to eat or grocery shopping in, you know, the aisles um, on the inside where they're full of snacks and things like that and um, high sodium foods. So doing grocery shopping to kind of help them with that. Also cooking classes virtually um, so that they can, again, um, have the skills and knowledge to actually do the cooking at home versus, again, going out to eat. Um, psychotherapy to help reduce depression or improve mindfulness. I'm working on a program right now to improve mindfulness, reduce depression. Um, so hopefully I'll have some good results with that. However, lastly, some potential drawbacks of full immersive VR. There are some ethical priorities we must consider before um, just delivering a VR program to these patients. Um, not all patients can participate. Um, like I said, we excluded individuals with um, risk of um, epilepsy, seizure, or vertigo. Um, so these patients would be advised not to participate. Um, but some other patients, um, individuals with um, dementia, they may not be able to differen differentiate the uh, VR world from real world. Um, so it, that may be an ethical uh, consideration to, to think of. And then lastly, um, we should also be using VR in short durations per session. So less than 30 minutes, um, there usually is no adverse symptoms of motion sickness. Um, it's once you start to increase that duration past 30 minutes is when you start to see the increased risk for motion sickness. Um, so I just finished up and say thank you very much to the uh, Rex committee for allowing me to speak today. And thank you to my lab, um, as well as Dr. Weiland and Dr. Hernandez and Keely and Drew from the Center of Innovation and Teaching and Learning here at Illinois. Um, they were the, actually the ones that created the VR program for us. And uh, I'll open up for questions. So thank you very much. Thank you very much for your presentation, Brad. Uh, we had a question from Paul, but you had, you had just answered it. But Nancy is asking you if you could describe what the Joviality program is. It sounds playful. It seems like a great idea. And she's congratulating and thank you for the innovative idea. Yes, thank you, Nancy. Uh, so uh, what it was, was again, the, uh, I'll go back. Let me, uh, if I can go back here. So again, they, they uh, put on the headset and they were kind of immersed in this first scene on the top right there with the fireplace. Um, in that screen, the um, individual spoke about, again, the benefits of mindfulness, um, how it can be used in everyday, everyday life, um, you know, how you should use it to, again, promote a kind of well-being um, and then, so that was about 10 to 12 minutes. Um, they interacted a little bit with it. Um, and then they went into the uh, second scene there with the tree and um, did uh, mindfulness exercises. So um, the exercises were, so they um, interacted with the tree. So if you can see, there's um, the yellow leaves on the tree. So if they stared at the tree, um, one of the leaves would break off and fall into the river to the, the left there, kind of symbolizing that their thought um, that they're thinking about was, or a negative thought um, was kind of floating away. And then they were able to do, um, again, more guided mindfulness. Um, and again, it was both about 10 to 12 minutes. Um, they, everybody seemed to enjoy it. Um, the only negative thing was that it was exactly the same thing from exposure one to exposure two. So some people on exposure two day got bored with it. So we need to, we know we need to change it up and add more um, options. Um, the biggest thing were to add options on where to meditate, um, like doing meditation at a beach or um, on top of a mountain, things like that. Okay, thank you very much for your answer, Brad. So I thank you again for your presentation. Uh, we are uh, a little bit late for the next speaker. So thank you very much. Thank you. Great, thank you. So um, I have the uh, honor of introducing the next speakers, Dr. Enrico Benedetti, who I've gotten to know rather well in the last few months. Um, he's a distinguished leader in organ transplantation, robotic assisted techniques and transplantation. 
Uh, he has successfully obtained a number of surgical firsts that few I wanted to share, including the uh, first robotic combined kidney and pancreas uh, procurement for living donor transplant, and the first robotic donor nephrectomy for living donor kidney transplant, as well as robotic kidney transplant in, in obese individuals, as well as others. And his specialties and services include kidney transplant, liver transplant, robotic and minimally invasive surgery, um, a small bowel transplant, hepatobiliary surgery, and uh, transplantation surgery, and uh, pancreas transplant. So he he's, uh, does a lot of things. And he's going to talk a little, on a little bit different topic today. Uh, it's, it's an exercise training intervention that's really um, an interesting protocol, and I'm not going to talk much about it. I'll let him do that, but they've got, he's been working with a, um, a former uh, bodybuilder that uh, that has developed a program uh, that involves really light resistance, um, resi uh, uh, low intensity resistance training program that has some remarkable benefits, and it's a little bit um, different than traditional resistance training programs being utilized in transplant patients or dialysis patients. And I'll let uh, Dr. Benedetti uh, describe the study that they have. Uh, so thank you for being here and I'll let you take it away. Thank you, Ken. I want first of all to thank you for the invitation. It's been a pleasure to follow uh, all this interesting talk. Eh? And uh, I'm trying to share my video. I'm sorry. I may need to come out from the... You want to do yeah, why don't you do it? I cannot... Uh... You hit the, the little <laughs> button down on the bottom. You see Presentation mode. All right, I'm good. Okay? Very good. I hope you can see now. First of all, I want to compliment everybody for an exceptional program. It was very inspiring hearing from patients from this original research. You may wonder what the surgeon is going to do among you, um, but uh, maybe by the end of the uh, talk, you, you will understand what moved me to try to improve the quality of life for patients that are either after kidney transplant or waiting for one. So the cycle of life is pretty much linked to muscle mass. Um, the mass of mass has a peak age 22, and then there is only a way down, a decay. This is a CT scan of the same uh, man, age 25 or so age 63. You can see that we lose muscle mass constantly and the curve can be sort of gentle, and then we live until older life. But if you start going be below this disability threshold, that's when people actually die. Anywhere that has been tested, this hypothesis all through, muscle skeletal decline is linked to mortality in this par particular prospective data from osteoporosis study was independent risk for mortality, poor musculoskeletal health. I can show you many paper after fracture, after uh, um, trauma in cancer patient. The common denominator is that if your muscle mass goes down, you have an increased risk of complication or death. I've been a transplant surgeon for almost 30 years. And I know that uh, the population that we serve is frail. This is a study from uh, Doris Sager from John Hopkins. He found in their patient population that 20% met uh, medical criteria for frailty. And um, if you look at the mortality at one year and five years, it's almost fivefold uh, the one that they're not frail. For example, in this study, 22.5% of the patient frail at the baseline died after kidney transplantation. Um, as Ken indicated, uh, I partner with um, uh, Greg H.A., that is a formidable and original thinker. Um, I'm not going to try to explain to you the detail of his method, but briefly, he tend to uh, exercise individual muscle with minimal expenditure of energy and a formidable overall effect 
Uh, this is actually one of uh, the Chicago ear of Keith Van Horn that was uh, a Bear uh, uh, National uh, Football League player. And he was in tremendous pain. He's part of a study that we did in FL Player for chronic pain, achieving total elimination of pain in all of them within three months. And it's amazing, even this big athlete, when they are in pain, they will move minuscule amount of weight safely that progressively go up to rehabilitation. So I think the most interesting aspect of this training is done only twice a week for one hour. And you can do probably in your regular street clothes because you never sweat. It's so focused on individual muscle group that pretty much there's no fatigue. It's ideal for population that are very frail. So I share with you the result of um, two study. The first one was a randomized trial um, performing a kidney transplant recipient, adult. Um, and uh, we actually proposed to randomize the patient in uh, either exercise versus control. The exercise did 12 months twice a week in non-dialysis day versus the control. Um, we actually complete with uh, several dropout. It is difficult to exercise on dialysis, as many people in this virtual room know. But we could compare 30, 41 patients versus 25. We end up having 60 and 40 in the study that will be published. And I want to show you the result. Again, one group receive a twice a week uh, resistance exercise program. The other 25, no exercise. So this uh, first slide just show the progress in uh, total exercise capacity. This is very precise measure because we multiply the number of repetition for the pounds that they lift. And you can see that in average, they quadruple their strength. We did uh, something interesting, which is we, with of course IRB consent, we did biopsy of the muscle in control versus exercise. Now we have actually more of this, but you can tell that uh, on the h &E staining, not much difference, but this is a staining for mitochondria. And you can see that exercise people built a lot of mitochondria that, you know, are the central of uh, energy production in the cell. Interestingly, this is a view of the myosin fibers. I have other slides um, with um, um, electron microscopy finding. No doubt the fibers number increase and the thickness increase in a significant difference between control versus exercise. So the peak strength improved, the bone mineral content improved, the level of pain interfering with daily activity went down. And uh, as the body got better, the mental health got better, mostly in the depression domain. Um, interestingly enough, uh, in patients that uh, were not employed at the baseline of the study, 53% um, found a job while on exercise versus only 8% on the control patient. This is a particularly import important uh, uh, result because going back to work is the final proof of rehabilitation. Uh, furthermore, the patient uh, in the United States, after at least in the US, after transplant, have a very low rate of return to job. So in 46,000 patients in UNOS database that were not working at the time of transplant, and after a year were alive with stable renal function, only five to 6% found the job. So it's a diffuse problem. And there is incentive that uh, I have to do with the public aid structure that actually discourage patients from going back to the workplace. But these people took the step and did it. Well, we went uh, to an even more challenging population after this. Start uh, a pilot study on dialysis patient, like the one that we discussed today. Uh, there's no doubt that the patient on dialysis very high prevalence muscle atrophy, lower functional capacity. 
And uh, in fact, uh, among the various chronic illness, probably renal failure is the one that has the biggest effect on muscle mass. Um, there is several studies that prove that um, uh, this is a real problem and uh, the, the reduced physical and cardiovascular capacity lead to depression that is quite prevalent in dialysis population. So we decided to do a pilot study. We took 11 patients from our dialysis population at University of Illinois, and we offered them, of course, all this exercise has been free. We supported from the university. One-to-one um, -one personalized exercise, muscle therapy, again, two sessions per week of six minutes each. Uh, we partner with uh, Dr. Fernal, that is our dean of applied health. So we use their facility. We work with physical therapists. And um, we actually enroll deliberately patient with um, very poor performance. Seven of 11 were wheelchair bound. So the pilot study result, again, this is a study on 11 patients over three months. And uh, if you uh, notice, as you know, P0.05 marks significant statistically difference, all these various uh, uh, parameters become statistically significantly different. Self-reported physical function by SF36 questionnaire statistically improved at six months, I'm sorry. Short performance battery score statistically improved. Pain interference T score significantly reduced. Energy fatigue score improved. The depression almost went to normal level, uh, underlying the link between the brain and the body. Clearly, a weak body cannot support happiness, as Maggie, uh, Maggie did in that beautiful presentation. She's happy because she's physically fit. General health. But if you, if I can, I want to show you a real case. I don't know if you have audio. Do we have audio, Ken? But I will comment on it. This is one of my Not patients sure. that came to see me in this very office uh, for pre-transplant evaluation. Um, diabetic, age 51 with um, tremendous compromission of his ability to walk. As you can see, he's trying to actually stand up from his wheelchair. He can do only once. Um, he was not able to stand up or walk. And uh, this is uh, Greg, the man that invented the method that is taking uh, Jeff for the first session. As you can see, it's even difficult to make them actually sit for the exercise. Those are very compromised patients with multiple comorbidities, diabetes, renal failure, a bad hip. And uh, as you very um, well known, uh, dealing with the dialysis population, cramping is a very disturbing symptom that is quite prevalent in the dialysis population. He had it all. You can tell the, how difficult it was simply to actually put him in the exercise machine in the proper fashion. We have by IRB the ability to actually uh, consent the patient for the exercise. So this is a patient that was uh, previously refused for transplant in another center. The day they came to me, I had to consult uh, the psychiatrist because he had suicidal ideation, that bad. And uh, little by little, he started getting better. This is the same man 16 weeks into the program. I guarantee you there is no trick. It's really the same man that now can actually easily get into the exercise. You can tell from his face that um, he's more relaxed. Uh, I show you the general index, but number don't give justice to the radical change of this patient uh, after this exercise program. Um, I can tell you that uh, seeing these people walk has been one of the greatest satisfaction of my life. I always felt that we did not complete the job, that we did the transplant, 
but we didn't uh, reestablish the full health of the patient. And uh, we do, do this test to, to prove how many times they can stand up. You remember that he barely did one at the beginning. And now he seems to be in a better shape. In fact, uh, uh, after the rehabilitation, the patient underwent a successful kidney transplant and is now fully rehabilitated after even a knee replacement that eliminates his limping. So, of course, if you have somebody with the formidable strength of mind and body of Madeline Warren, they can do by themselves. But majority of patients uh, need uh, a, at least an initial help when they overcome this hurdle, then uh, they, will, uh, they will do it on their own. But I think uh, we need to provide that kind of support. Now, many people in the room are experienced scientists. They know that it's very difficult to exercise dialysis patients. No matter what you do, it's very difficult. And I applaud all the effort that have been done in Italy, in England, in the US to address this important problem. But clearly, we, um, we have a system that uh, works and works in the most extreme case. And as we discussed with Ken, no. there is not a single uh, no, uh, magic bullet to solve the problem. But maybe different patients need different things. I would say people that are greatly debilitated are better off with a program like this. I'm happy to inform you that we have now an ongoing randomized trial, uh, slowed down by the COVID, but still active with 41 patients per role. And probably a year and a half, I will show you the result of this randomized trial. For the moment, I thank you very much for letting me participate to this fascinating meeting, and I'm open to answer your question. Thank you. Great, thank you very much for those, those, those videos are just incredible. And that's one of the things that um, was kind of drew me to when I, when I met Greg, you're the, the trainer, um, it's kind of blown away. And I actually, just a little anecdote, I, I went through with Greg and he showed me how they do the assessments and how they do the training. And it's, as an exercise physiologist, um, I know you didn't get into a lot of the details of, of how he does the training, but it's, um, it's bizarre, it's, it's, it's not, you know, necessarily what I learned as an exercise <laughs> physiologist in terms of how to do resistance training. But, um, you know, it, it is it is pretty fascinating uh, thinking outside of the box um, kind of approach to rehabilitating these individuals. And, and you did, you mentioned um, uh, that, you know, it, this is, I want everybody to recognize that if they miss this, it's two hours, one hour twice a week on a non-dialysis day we're just talking about the dialysis patients, the same kind of protocol for the transplant patients, but for dialysis patients who come to a clinic, um, to, to a gym, actually, on a non-dialysis day twice a, a week for an hour, for a year, for a one-on-one -on -one program, it, it's, that's not, that's not the standard approach. I and mean, we've, we've always tried to do something that's relatively easy, like interdialytic cycling or long-distance walking programs, something that's, that's easier for the patient too. But this is, it's it's low intensity, but it's pretty intense in terms of the time commitment. So it's just a fascinating approach, and you see the benefits. So I'm looking through the um, uh, comments here. Um, you know, powerful videos. Uh, this may be a controversial idea, but given the prevalence of muscle wasting and CKD, is there a benefit of combining exercise with a controlled regimen of anabolic steroids? Um, or TRT type treatments that help offset loss of muscle uh, or an individual's energy levels? We did not combine uh, the uh, exercise with anything. We just compare uh, the patient uh, undergoing the twice a week exercise with patient uh, undergoing a sort of standard of care for either dialysis or after transplant. Uh, of course, uh, it's not a bad idea, it should be considered, but we want uh, to analyze initially simply the impact of the exercise method on their strength, uh, performance, and uh, 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 mental health. Yeah, and, and I think I would add just that there is a, um, a sort of classic, say from Kirsten Johansson's group that did just that. They combined a resistance training program with um, Nandrolone um, 
uh, injections uh, for like a three or four month program and they saw some sort of additive benefits. There's some weird findings in that paper, but um, you can look that up. It's an interesting idea. This is another from uh, some Henrik Erickson. Uh, is there any education in this type of training? So this is what we are now struggling with. Um, even with, in discussion with Ken, we would like, of course, uh, to have more people having access to this uh, method. Um, the people that are trained to do it are small, and the people that know how to create the program are even smaller <laughs> number. Um, we have actually meeting with Ken try to tackle that problem. Um, but um, my commitment is to uh, continue to push this program and make it available to as many people as possible. That's my ultimate goal. Uh, for example, in our own uh, university hospital, the administration has agreed to, uh, uh, in the new transplant clinic, to dedicate a room exclusively to this kind of exercise with the idea the patient will come in the morning, have the blood drawn, do the exercise and then seen by the doctor. I think it will be a better experience all around. And in the meantime, they'll become strong again and maybe go back to work. So I, I'm uh, working on it. We are talking about web-based presence. We are talking about uh, standardized method that could be done in a semi-automatic fashion, many initiatives. Yeah, and actually now Henrik is, is clarified his question. I'm glad he asked it the way he did because I think it was an important way to ask as well. But he was asking, actually he meant to ask if there's available education to learn this type of training. So how to do the details of, of what Greg has put together. Definitely there will be. And uh, I saw a question regarding university physical therapy student. Well, in uh, the setting of this new uh, clinic, we will have, of course, uh, trained and accredited physical therapists to administer the treatment because otherwise in hospital setting you cannot do it uh, and uh, we are in this uh, at this time uh, studying how to do the training so it's uh, the time that we scale it up i believe at least to, to my satisfaction and expert like ken believe this is a really a valid uh, valid strategy i have no financial uh, uh, conflict of interest. I just uh, believe that this is something that will help a lot, especially the most debilitated patient that we have. Great. Um, and Nancy has asked, um, and Nancy, you can might clarify this. Are you, yes, if, if you did any interviews with him, are you talk, referring to the, the individual in the video? He was very motivated. So did you interview yeah. the patients? Yeah. I was actually thinking of all of them, that was there a qualitative side, an opportunity to learn what their experience was like and what kept them going. Well, I, we have uh, uh, dozens of video like that. I pick one, but we, we film everybody. And in a way or another, their story is just marvelous and fascinating. And uh, some of them uh, will make you cry as you, as you uh, watch the video. People that didn't work for 10 years went back to do maybe a work like a bus driver uh, or cleaning up the street of their city in Michigan, they make you cry. And uh, to me, that's the final measure of rehabilitation, when people actually fend for themselves and have the courage to abandon sort of the safety of the public aid, of the check coming every month, and actually take the risk on their own to become independent. And that's what we need to seek. I mean, uh, Madeline is right. These people shouldn't be limited. They shouldn't have limit to their goal, to their dream, regardless uh, if they're on dialysis or after transplant. Great. And Paul has asked if there are any university exercise science students involved in the research. Well, I, I believe that they will. They, they are already involved because they're helping us to measure. Uh, all these measurements that we publish are done uh, uh, with the help of our study coordinator and student that actually had to train her. Um, of course, at the moment we have actually a crazy physical therapist belonging to the uh, College of uh, Applied Health, actually administering the exercise, then it's gonna be like any other academic activity. There will be student, there will be faculty, there will be uh, all the usual attention. 
And I'll just say that they, I, I don't know if you anybody caught this or Paul, if you caught this, they, Bo Fern Hall, they're running this program in Bo Fern Hall's lab at the uh, UIC now. Um, and do we have, yeah, we still have a couple minutes here. Um, from Brett, uh, can you comment on how sustainable this one-on-one -on -one approach is? Once the intervention ends, how will the patient continue exercising? So we decided to do the study in the best possible circumstances with the full attention with the trainer one-to-one -one with the patient. And I believe that especially at the beginning is very important. Of course, uh, I already told you that we have um, a, attempted quite successfully telepresence that could multiply the program. Uh, I know that we could do more than one patient in the same room. It's uh, practical. Um, I believe that uh, eventually the program will be individual at the beginning and rapidly the patient graduate when he knows more to a sort of a group setting. If we want to scale it up, we will not have the luxury to a one-to-one -one forever but we decided to do it to give the patient the best uh, opportunity. Great. Um, Dan Ristia has asked if you intend to uh, do any aerobic training um, or add aerobic training to the program. Um, we, we will stick to it for now. And uh, what's interesting is that as the individual muscle mass increase, these patients do the aerobic by themselves. We have uh, a, another trial that we use for debilitated liver transplant patient in the inpatient setting. And you know that uh, we tend to do physical therapy early on for this patient. And uh, this system works better. <laughs> and uh, if you think about, if you've ever been sick, I hope nobody had, but if you go to an hospital, the first thing that the physical therapist will make you do is walk, right? except most people are not ready to walk. It's best to build up the muscle need to support your body and then walk. You don't forget to walk. You just need to have the proper strength in the muscle. That's why I believe is a good strategy. That's great. And last question I'll take us from Stephanie. Uh, how is the exercise actually prescribed? I'm sorry, I mean- How is the exercise prescribed? So can you talk a little bit about, I guess, what, what Greg That's does? That's the, the, the genius of Greg. Uh, pretty much he play around with um, factors such as uh, the weight, the range of motion, the rapidity of the movement, uh, how fast you contract, how fast you release. Um, and uh, pretty much uh, he attacked the muscle from the several standpoint, resistance, strength, thickness, that combined uh, come up with this impressive result. You might wonder how the hell I decide to do it because I was originally a client of Greg that within uh, three weeks eliminate all my pain from knee, uh, elbow, uh, plantar surface on my foot by exercise only. I was impressed because I never sweat. I never had any problem. And I figured this is good for people that have no energy. And maybe I was right. More to see, but so far I'm impressed. As am I, and I think there's a lot of people impressed on, with, your, with your presentation. That was, that was excellent. Thank you so much. I think we're out of time for questions, but we're gonna have a, so thank you very much, Dr. Benedetti. Um, you, and ben. we're gonna thank turn you, it over to Paul and Clara uh, for sort of a wrap up and closing remarks. Hi there. I'm Clara Bohm. I'm uh, one of the researchers and nephrologists in Winnipeg, Canada. Um, so I would really like to thank all of our speakers, which actually um, excitingly included students, clinicians, researchers, and people living with kidney disease uh, for presenting and for sharing their research and their knowledge with us. Um, I would also like to thank the scientific committee uh, and Joao, Giorgio, Stephanie, and Tom for putting together this uh, great afternoon. Uh, when I looked at it originally, I thought it seemed a bit long, but it has flown by and been really interesting. So thank you to you to putting in the work uh, to doing this and really helping us learn about 
uh, new ways, uh, new opportunities to increase activity, improve physical function and quality of life in people with kidney disease. But also, I think very importantly, reminding us not to think about being sick, but to uh, really think about and work on being well. And that's what I'm going to take away from this uh, talk. And I would encourage everybody else to take that away, not just for our patients, but also for ourselves in this time of COVID. Um, lastly, uh, I'm going to ask Oksana to put up a slide that we arranged <laughs> at the beginning of this. Um, I just want to put in a plug for uh, Grex. So Grex has members all over the world. You can see in the green is where we currently have membership uh, and we're always looking for more members. Um, we really are a very diverse group of people, both uh, as you can see across the world, but also in terms of professions, specialties and interests and uh, a welcoming and a fun group when we can get together again. The website is, uh, is on the bottom of the slide and you can just go to that website, look around, see what we're about and there's, it tells you how to register and how to become part of Grex. Um, I think that was, that's the end of my uh, assignment and I'm going to pass you on to Paul Bennett. Thank you, Clara. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you to everyone that's been involved. This has been a, a fabulous um, presentation. I'd particularly like to thank the contribution of the, the patient partners, um, Maddie, uh, Nancy and, and Kevin. Um, I, I learn off you guys every time I, I see you and listen to you and it's brilliant and it's a focus that we've tried to continue um, and, and again, thank you so much. Um, I'd specifically like to thank Oksana, who many of you um, have corresponded with. She's tremendous. She's the glue that holds GREX together and does an incredible, fabulous job. And uh, webinars like these wouldn't have, wouldn't have occurred with, without her because um, me from down under with my kangaroos, um, exercising with, with the kangaroos, um, I don't often have time to be able to put all of this together as many of us don't. Um, a brief uh, message, I think the, there'll be a link to these, um, these uh, talks on um, the GREX website, so look out for that if you wanted to uh, review any of those fabulous videos and talks that we saw. And finally, um, the next uh, webinar will be on January the 28th and you'll be receiving information regarding um, that webinar. So all in all, I'd like to thank everyone again. Thank you for participating. Thanks for all of the questions. Um, thank you for the great talks. And um, I'd like to close for now and wish everyone a very happy holiday time and, and festive time over. over um, and stay safe. And I look forward to being with you and seeing you in the new year. Thank you. Thank you.